Out of context, facts and figures can easily mislead. Is Africa's growing population a weakness? What about tomorrow? Don't get boxed in by today's opinions. With the Africa Report, understand Africa's tomorrow today. Politics, business, opinion, the Africa Report decodes the news for you. Available online on theafricareport.com. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. Um, and I hope you're enjoying our conference uh, to celebrate our 25th anniversary uh, covering emerging and frontier markets. This morning, we're going to be talking about uh, frontier, uh, specifically North Africa uh, and Egypt, of course, which is part of um, the emerging market universe. So focus on Morocco, Egypt and Tunisia. Um, I don't want to rerun the big picture story that we talked about on Monday. Uh, that video is still available on YouTube. Um, but the two key conclusions were that euro dollar, which has been in a bearish trend for EM, strengthening dollar story for 10 years, we think is going to be a gradual dollar depreciation story in coming years as a result of the US presidential election. Um, the second theme, which comes out of the whole COVID shock is very high debt levels uh, in the West, I think are going to keep US Treasury yields very low, uh, sub 2% for the coming decade. And as a result, investors are going to be seeking yield in emerging markets. Uh, that's already been a story for the last 20 years. Falling yield from 12% in 2000 to 4% dollar yields in 2020. And I think it's going lower. So. That's telling us that, that investors are going to put more money into emerging markets um, and North Africa are some of the more interesting ones we've been focusing on. Um, within Africa, uh, this, this chart's highlighting how important Egypt, Morocco are, uh, and Tunisia is interesting also as a, a democracy, uh, according to Polity 4. Uh, that's the colouring there, the orange. Uh, but each, each square there is a couple of billion dollars worth of GDP. The reason the, we put in the Polity 4 rating um, is that I think it explains why the IMF, the EU, the US has been so supportive of Tunisia. 
um, in the last 10 years. Uh, they're very keen to see uh, the Arab Spring success, political success, also supported in economic terms. But having said that, the World Bank has praised Morocco over the last 10 years for what it called the best fiscal reform effort in the MENA region, Middle East, North Africa. And, and the IMF is super supportive of Egypt too. So, so to be fair, the Western support, IMF support, IFI support is quite strong for all three. Um, what's going on right now? Well, we've got a massive hit from tourism. Um, North Africa gets about 2 to 5% of GDP uh, in tourism receipts, um, and, and that's gone um, this year. The good news from the vaccine, if it continues to be good news, is that I think we could then get a second half 2021 recovery on tourism, which would be very helpful for all three countries. Um, that's quicker than the IMF has been expecting. If you look at the IMF numbers that came out last month in the World Economic Outlook, they're basically not looking for the current accounts to get back to 29 level, 2019 levels, even until 2022. So the vaccine could be quite helpful news on this front. What's happened to GDP? I mean, it's a really different story. Uh, you've got a 3% a fall in Egypt's GDP in the second quarter, 15% fall in Morocco, 21% fall, a uh, shockingly big number, worst in Africa, according to the data we have so far for Tunisia. Um, so very, very different numbers. Um, what's, what, what's driving that? Um, of course, it is COVID. We've seen governments react quite differently um, across the three countries. So Morocco's numbers right now, um, I just updated this this morning. Um, we've had about 35,000 cases uh, just in the last week, new cases in Morocco. That's the highest in Africa. Um, and, and the numbers have been heading up for months. Uh, Tunisia now has roughly the same amount of new cases as South Africa. And South Africa's got a vastly bigger population. And then we've got Egypt, which has apparently got very few cases at all. Um, which is which is great news. And given they've got 100 million people in the country, um, that's helping explain why the government's taken a very light approach to lockdown. They never did what Pakistan did or what India did in April or what South Africa did. Uh, Egypt has taken the lightest, probably the lightest tone on, on the lockdown of all three countries. Morocco is not as stringent perhaps as it was, but it's worth remembering what I got told on a, a panel, an, an Africa panel a few months ago, that, that when the Moroccans get hit by a disease like COVID, they react pretty similarly to, to, to Europeans. It was pointed out to me by, by someone, look, we don't have malaria like they do in Sub-Sahara. We don't have Ebola. Um, we, we worry about uh, things like COVID. So, so we have reacted more. And I think that's played out then in the GDP figures. Um, the model we did back in April did highlight that of the countries in Africa, Morocco, which is the green column right in the middle of this, this chart, was liable to lose more people from, from COVID than anybody else in Africa uh, because it's, it's got a somewhat older population than most countries in Africa. Um, so we estimated that, that nearly... Uh, if 20% if of the country got COVID, uh, deaths would be roughly four weeks worth of extra deaths uh, versus, say, two and a half in Egypt. Um, so it, it's also understandable from that point of view, from the age sensitivity point of view, that Morocco would have been more cautious about COVID itself anyway. Um, and there's also an additional factor. I haven't got all three countries on this table. But obesity levels are quite high in the MENA region. Um, and a lot of people have been talking about that as a risk factor for COVID. Um, so Egypt, um, our, our world in data reckons a third of people in Egypt are obese uh, in 2016. Um, and, the, and the figures for Algeria are pretty high as well. So that is saying that there is another reason for North Africa to be more cautious about COVID and to have taken more measures to, to address it. And Egypt then is the interesting exception for not having done so. 
but, but the benefits are coming through in the GDP figures. Um, if you take Bloomberg consensus on the left hand side there, um, the expectation is Egypt will still grow at 2% this year before picking up to three next year and five the year after. Um, you've got Morocco and Tunisia dropping, what, 6% according to Bloomberg consensus. Uh, the IMF numbers are on the right hand side. The IMF numbers tell us that Egypt should be the fourth best growing economy in the world uh, in 2020. Um, I do need to just point out, though, that that's because the IMF quotes the fiscal year, second half 2019, first half 2020. So the 3.5% the, the IMF's talking about is really quite a lot about late 2019 when, when growth was very good. Um, so it's slightly misleading. But the Bloomberg consensus is still showing you that, that in terms of the growth over the period of 2019 to 21, it's going to be Egypt up about 11% cumulatively. Um, Morocco up one, uh, Tunisia down one. Um, what else, apart from lockdown itself, has driven this? It's Egypt's still quite a closed economy. Uh, it's the most closed economy actually in emerging markets in terms of exports to GDP. So it's less sensitive to what's happening in the rest of the world. Egypt exports in goods and services in 2017, so including tourism. $500 worth of, of export receipts a year per capita. Morocco, more than double that, 1,200, and, and Tunisia, triple that at 1,500. So Tunisia, the most sensitive uh, on a per capita basis to what's happened globally. And I think that has played a role in their worst GDP figures. Going back over 25 years, 30 years, um, actually, interestingly, all three have grown by two to three percent per capita since 1991. So there hasn't been actually much difference uh, between the three. Um, we think there's going to be more difference over the coming decade, uh, and I'm going to explain why. As you'll have probably heard me say before, I think education is vital uh, and, and a prerequisite for industrialization. And the good news on adult literacy is that North Africa looks great. Anyone in green is in a good place. Uh, dark green is a really good place. 70 to 80 percent adult literacy in North Africa. That's enough to industrialize. It's only happened quite recently, though. Um, the first country was Tunisia, uh, as early as perhaps 1995 to, to, to 2000. Tunisia already crossed that 70 percent threshold. Uh, but Morocco and Egypt have now caught up. Electricity, absolutely vital. Again, green is good. And you can see that why we think North Africa is going to be leading Africa's second industrialization wave. Um, they've got the education and they've got the electricity too. The third thing we like to see is high investment. Um, ideally, well, 20% is helpful. 20% of GDP is helpful. Uh, above 25% of GDP is really good. Countries that have converged towards American wealth levels have got investment above 25% of GDP. Now, I just updated these numbers uh, a few weeks ago, and Egypt's got better in the last two to three years. It was sitting at around 13, 14% of GDP. The investment number is now 18% of GDP, but it's still not high enough. Tunisia, 16% of GDP, uh, and, and definitely a problem. Uh, Morocco, fantastic, 32% of GDP. And you see that in the infrastructure every time you visit. Um, so this is, this is very helpful for them. Where can you get this investment from? Well, it can be government investment. It can be locally financed from your banks. Um, and it can be foreign direct investment. Uh, and the figures there for Egypt and Morocco are similar on the bottom chart. It's about well, $80 per head of foreign direct investment. But the difference between the two is that in Egypt's case, it's a lot into offshore oil and gas. While in Morocco's case, it's been more into manufacturing. The top right graph, which I'm sure you can't see properly, um, the blue columns are FDI flows in dollars to Central Europe, which 
benefited massively in the 1990s from cheap wages, EU membership that was coming up, and, and also the good education numbers. But what's been interesting in the last 10 years is how North Africa, which is the red column, has been picking up. Um, and I think that's going to carry on. And it's going to carry on because, I'll have mentioned this before as well, probably, um, you've got the working age population keeps on growing in North Africa, while in, in Central Europe, Czech, Hungary, Poland, on the left-hand side of that chart, you've got shrinking working age populations. Uh, and the, the consequence of that comes out via wages. In terms of which countries are, are looking best, um, Egypt's the one with the biggest population growth uh, at, at nearly 2% a year. Uh, Morocco about one, Tunisia about half. Now I think this is quite important because I think Tunisia is getting to the point now where it's in danger of losing its demographic dividend uh, and I'm going to get to that in a minute. Um, but when it comes to wages, uh, this slide is, is we've got Egypt on the right hand side in blue, uh, minimum wage is about $120 in June, uh, Tunisia about $140 just next to it, um, Morocco $290. Why is Morocco so much more expensive than Tunisia or Egypt? I think because it's attracted FDI over the, the last 10 years and not just offshore oil and gas. Uh, and partly because it's been stable and hasn't had the volatility that Tunisia had with the Arab Spring uh, and e Egypt happened in 2011 and 2013. Um, but, but my point is that all of them look really cheap compared to Central Europe, which used to get Europe's manufacturing investment flow. But I think over the next 10 years, more and more is going to come to, to North Africa. How are we doing for time? We're OK. Right. Equity investors, what should you be focusing on? Have a, have a think about the fact that, that at the moment you're under allocated to Morocco. Just 3% of frontier funds are allocated to Morocco, we think. Um, the benchmark weight is 8%. And by the end of this month, it's going to be 13%. And, and this is because Kuwait's leaving the index. Vietnam's going to become number one. Morocco comes the second most important market in frontier. Not so helpful for Tunisia, to be fair. Tunisia still stays super small at 1%. Um, and there is a problem here also for Egypt. It's just 0.1% of the emerging market index. I've been talking about the frontier index there, but the emerging market index, Egypt's 0.1%. And when we looked into how much time should EM investors allocate to Egypt each year, if they allocate time according to the weights, it was three hours a year to Egypt. Uh, for frontier investors, it's been about 200 hours a year for Morocco and, and about 16 for Tunisia. What that's telling us today is that Egypt could be better served if it joined frontier maybe, but, but more important and more likely is that you need local investors in Egypt to say, I'm not getting double digit yields anymore in local debt, I'm going to start buying equities. Um, and we think that story starts uh, to grow in 2021. Um, what would you buy? You could look at the banks, of course. Uh, they're significant in, in, in each market. Um, and, and banking penetration, according to this World Bank survey, is quite low. Um, I suspect that's gender related. In terms of how much growth in the bank, uh, bank lending can we see, Morocco is already very high by frontier standards at 93% of GDP uh, back in 2018. And I think that bank lending story, because it's already so high, is obviously why we've seen Nati Jarawafa think about expanding into Egypt, where it's more like 40% of GDP, or West Africa, Cote d'Ivoire and Senegal. Um, Tunisia, I've got less to say on, on, this, on this graph. Um, what about Eurobond investors? What are they thinking about? about North Africa? Well, Morocco is able to borrow 1.7% on their 2022 bond, under 4% uh, when they borrow offshore, uh, even at a 20 year horizon. Egypt is also popular 
Um, you can still get a good yield, 7% on the 2040. We've been recommending investors be in Egypt, hard currency debt for a long time. Uh, Tunisia, much riskier, 8.5% uh, yield. Uh, and you can see investors are worried about the country. Uh, and the reason they're worried is, is partly because of this external debt burden. Uh, the total debt service is about 100% of, of exports in Tunisia. Uh, Egypt is more like 40% uh, and looks much better. And Morocco, I'm not even showing on that chart because it r really isn't problematic. Why can Morocco borrow so cheaply in Eurobond markets at just uh, 2% or so as they did with the Eurobond just the other, the other week? I think it's related to fertility rates uh, and demographics, and I've talked about this before. Um, so we've got the number of, of children per woman at, at two to three in Morocco and Tunisia, and that should be keeping their borrowing costs down because if you've got less children, you have high savings. Uh, Egypt should be paying more than those two countries uh, because their fertility rate's a bit higher. And I've shown this before in terms of banking share, uh, banking deposits to, to GDP, um, and, and very high fertility countries tend to have very low deposits. And that tends to be consistent with interest rates as well. So I, I think the reason Morocco, apologise for this chart, it's a year out of date, because of shenanigans in the Nigerian local debt market, but which I don't think can last. But the point here is that even a year ago, Morocco could borrow at roughly the same rates as Vietnam or China. Um, but, but countries with higher fertility tend to have much higher rates. Now, I think the Egypt number is the one that's going to go down the most out of those countries on the right. Um, and that's going to happen soon. When we've looked at, at demographics, there's two elements to, to what we call a demographic dividend, which are very powerful. And the first is that people have less kids, their savings go up, interest rates come down, so there's a lot more capital to support investment. Uh, and that's certainly been working in Morocco. <laughs> the second part of the story is that when you have less kids, you've got, after 10 or 20 years, a bigger share of the population are adults who can go out to work. They don't have to stay at home looking after the kids anymore. And you see that on per capita GDP uh, growth rates. So th the chart on the left here is showing you that when you've got one adult per kid, kid or pensioner actually, but you know, per dependent if you like, when you've got one adult, you grow at 1.4% per capita. That's normal. When you've got two and a half kids, sorry, two and a half adults per kid, then you're growing at what, four to five percent per capita. That's your Asian boom story that we've all noticed in the last 10 years. So we looked then at all of Africa. I don't expect you to be able to see the details on this, but, but the red is when you only have one adult. The green is when you've got one and a half to two and a half adults per kid. And you can see that from 1960 to about 2010, most of Africa wasn't going to be growing fast in per capita terms because it didn't have the demographic dividend, uh, too many kids. Uh, Mauritius was the first country to look really good on this. It's about two thirds of the way down. And of course, it's the second richest country in Africa today. Um, it's getting better for Tunisia and, and Morocco. Um, and, and Egypt's been getting better a bit in the last five years, five or 10. What we can then do is say, what were the growth rates? And I'm really not gonna go into this chart too much. What were the growth rates compared to what our model says is normal? And we can look ahead and say, what should growth be? How has it actually been performing? So this is just to prove to you that I've done some work before coming up with the the more important slide, which is this one. Egypt, let's start with Egypt. In 2005 to 10, Egypt actually grew faster than our model said it should. Egypt grew by about 1.4% every year better than our model said it should. And it was already saying it should grow quite well. This was the time of Mubarak's reforms. 
That was also the time that everyone loved emerging markets. Then 2010 to 15, the second column, Egypt's underperforming our model by two and a half percent. Growth really not meeting what our demographic model says it should. But of course, that was the Arab Spring, the coup of 2013, and so on. 2015 to 2020, it's slightly underperformed. Now, the IMF is saying, they were saying before COVID, so I'm trying to get beyond the COVID horizon here. They were saying that Egypt should grow at 6% a year. Um, that would be about 1% better than our model says. Our model says five is what we should expect uh, for the medium to long term. But, but if Egypt can industrialize, and I think it can because of all the good wages and all, all the figures we've talked about, then I think it can outperform. But I don't think it's gonna happen in 2021 or 2022, because I don't think manufacturing investors are gonna be pouring money into Egypt right now, just after a global recession. Uh, so I think that's been pushed out. The good growth of say, really good growth of say six or 7% is now a 2023, 2024 story. Let's go to Morocco. Morocco performed in line with the model, 2005 to 10. And again, 2010 to 15, but it underperformed a bit in 2015 to 20, about one and a half percent less than the model said. Why? I think because Europe's growth is so weak. Uh, the IMF is saying that they could grow at four a year. I think five is possible because Morocco really is leading this second industrialization wave. Um, and they continue to get the manufacturing investment coming in. We do have new car factories who are going to be ready to pump out a lot more vehicles when Europeans are buying in big numbers again. Tunisia, this is the difficult one. Tunisia was, was growing roughly in line with the model up to 2010. Since then, it's underperformed for a decade by 2 to 3% every year, growing less than it should. Um, the IMF has been looking for it to grow at three and a half. The model says it should grow at four and a half. And I was hopeful until last year that that, that could happen now in the next few years. I'm more skeptical, not just because of COVID. I'm, I'm, I'm more talking medium term now. I'm more skeptical now because, because we haven't had the elections at the end of last year deliver us the strong reform minded government that the country probably needs. Um, so I'd, I'd be more concerned about it growing at maybe 3% in the medium term at the moment. Um, so I'm slightly more pessimistic than we were. So what we were saying a year ago is that over 10 years, we expected Egypt to start to industrialize and that to boost growth by 90% over 10 years, 11 years actually. And we thought Morocco would grow 75%, outperforming Africa, outperforming EM, massively outperforming developed markets. Tunisia, we were looking to grow about 60%, but I, I, I'd be inclined to say more like 50 and maybe not even that, unless we start to see some real change um, in that economy. I do need to touch on currencies, of course. Um, when we look at African currencies, you've got three very different stories. Uh, Start at the bottom, Tunisia, fourth cheapest currency in Africa um, of the ones we look at. 16% undervalued at the fifth column along, but it's still running a horrible current account deficit, even though the currency has been super cheap for three years. Um, I don't see this changing. I don't see the currency rebounding uh, very well uh, beyond what happens because of euro dollar. Morocco, I've got just nothing to worry about in Morocco. Uh, it's fair value, it's 3% overvalued, that's meaningless. It's absolutely fair value, it's, it's in a good place. We know the current account's been hit because of tourism, but that could start to get much better at the end of next year. Egypt then is the question mark. What's going on in Egypt? It's 20% overvalued. I understand why, so it's offering good interest rates. Uh, good real interest rates. If you look at the right hand side, 13.5% well, one year uh, T-bill rate versus 
four and a half percent inflation. This is this is really good. Um, so it's it's overvalued for a good reason. I do assume we see gradual depreciation next year. How often a currency is this cheap or expensive? Uh, Tunisia right now is is about nearly twenty percent undervalued, fifteen to twenty percent, and twenty eight percent of the time in the last. 25 years, it's been this cheap. So there's no reason, this isn't giving me any signal that that's going to change anytime soon. Morocco, 94% of the time, it's around fair value. You, you don't need to worry about currency risk in Morocco, I don't think. Uh, Egypt, Egypt doesn't usually stay this strong for long. Um, so I, I do hope that interest rate cuts next year help to reduce that overvaluation. Um, this is looking at Egypt over 25 years. Uh, the black line is, is what the currency has done in today's money terms. So in, in today's money, it was as cheap as 27 to the dollar uh, in, in 04. Uh, it's been as strong as about 13, actually more like 13 to the dollar yet in 2016-17 in today's money. Um, we're on the strong side of fair value right now. Morocco, though, just consistently close to fair value. Um, I just want to end on one issue of politics because we did a lot of work on this back in 2016 again um, to look at the chance of regimes changing um, and the driver here is per capita GDP it's a symbol of uh, symbolic of, of middle class size uh, and, and the middle classes always demand democracy in the end uh, unless they live in oil exporting countries, when they get rich enough. So you can judge what the risk is of political change. Um, now, Egypt, 88% chance it maintains the current regime in any given year. Um, but there's a 10% chance of a shift towards democracy. It's what Polity 4 calls open anocracy. It's a bit like Turkey uh, is today. Um, or, or Russia for that matter, there's a 2% chance of it going to democracy. Uh, it tends not to happen in one go like that. Um, Morocco, very similar numbers. Uh, Morocco, 10.5% chance of also shifting towards democracy. So what this is telling me is that in any given year, you know, nine times out of 10, nothing's going to change. But one year in 10, we should be thinking about a political shift uh, more openness, more power to parliament, and so on. Tunisia, interestingly, very secure democracy, 97% chance it stays where it is. So, big picture, um, Egypt's the outperformer on growth right now, uh, and, and that's helpful. Uh, we think that interest rate cuts, probably two to 300 basis points next year, will finally give us that domestic demand that we've been talking about now for two years uh, and keeps on not happening because of the EM crises in 2018, perhaps because of COVID in 2020. We're hoping it comes in 2021. Um, over the medium term, it's easier to be bullish on Morocco and Egypt right now. Um, on the currency side, as I said, no risk on Morocco. There is risk in Tunisia. That does remain a difficult market and small. Um, Egypt, a little bit overvalued. I'd be hoping to see the currency at 16 and a half, 17 by the end of next year. Might not happen, it may stay strong, um, but I'd hope interest rate cuts help us towards that. I'm gonna stop there. Um, the presentation is available. Um, you can see the uh, video on, on, on YouTube and so on in the future as well. Um, but thank you very much for your attention and time. I'm now going to hand over to Saji Solanke, who's going to be heading up our Egypt FinTech panel um, with some, some people who really do know what they're talking about, uh, which is helpful. Um, so I hope you enjoy that and look forward to seeing you soon. Take care.
Out of context, facts and figures can easily mislead. Is Africa's growing population a weakness? What about tomorrow? Don't get boxed in by today's opinions. With the Africa Report, understand Africa's tomorrow today. Politics, business, opinion, the Africa Report decodes the news for you. Available online on theafricareport.com.